Gruber, an associate professor of psychology at the University of Colorado Boulder. We're here today with Dr. Tanya Lombroso, a professor of psychology at Princeton University, to talk with her about her experience with science communication and outreach. This is part of a four-part interview series on communicating psychological science with the public, sponsored by the Association for Psychological Science. Thanks for joining us today, Tanya. Thanks for having me, June. So Tanya, what I'd love to just get started with is asking you to tell us a little bit more about the kind of public outreach you've done. Sure, so mainly my public outreach has taken the form of writing. I've always really loved to write and I've always really appreciated other people's communication of science to general audience. And mostly that's been in the form of uh, blogging for a general audience, also writing some articles. So how did you go about getting started doing blogging? I know through NPR and other writing venues. So it was always something that appealed to me. I, I discovered cognitive science when I was in high school. And so for me, the entry point was really through the writers who managed to make it really accessible and exciting. And so I always knew it was something that appealed to me. And then in late 2011 or 2012, I first had um, some people from Psychology Today reach out to me and ask if I was interested in doing some blogging for them. And I started that and I found that to be uh, pretty rewarding. And then I was contacted by NPR. So at the time, NPR hosted a blog called 13.7 Cosmos and Culture. And it was a blog with five academics. Everybody had a day of the week. And we could blog about anything at the intersection of science and culture very broadly construed. And so I was Mondays for uh, almost six years <laughs> um, doing a weekly blog post for NPR. And had you done any kind of writing of this sort before you got into blogging? I know you've enjoyed writing, um, you know, since, since high school, but had this been a new form of writing for you? It was new to me. So it was really a crash course in writing in that format, right? Writing a very, very short 500 word, 1200 word uh, ar uh, articles. Um, it was new for me to be writing for that audience. And it was also new for me to be writing for weekly deadlines, right? As an academic, sometimes we face conference deadlines or other kinds of deadlines, but normally we have the luxury of working on writing for a more extended period of time. And so there were, there were many things about adjusting to the blogging medium that, um, that were sort of a steep learning curve for me. I was just gonna ask, when you said a weekly deadline, I'm sure, um, as you're saying, for, for many academics, and I'm sure many of the people listening to this interview today, that feels like a lot, right? To be writing a brand new blog post every single week. And so, I'm just wondering, you know, how did you go about managing your time doing this for six years while you're, you know, running a lab, um, teaching, being a parent, um, and then adding in kind of public outreach to the mix? Right. Well, I'll start, I'll start with the parts that were really lovely about it. So yeah. it felt to me like an excuse to get to read all of the neat research being done that wasn't close enough to my own papers that I was working on that I would feel I would otherwise get to read them. So it really felt like it gave me um, it sort of justified getting to read things just for fun and looking through the table of contents of journals and looking at journals that I might not otherwise be reading. And so that part of it was, it was, it was really lovely and sort of always being on the lookout for something that seemed like it would lend itself to, to that audience and to that format. It was definitely a challenge to try to fit that in with running a lab and parenting and um, all sorts of other demands on our time. The two things that I tried to do to help with that. So one was I tried to choose topics that were synergistic with other things that I was thinking about. So for example, if I had a new project in my lab that required delving into a new area, I might use a blog post as an excuse to read some of that literature or go down a sort of parallel rabbit hole that I might not otherwise get to pursue. Um, and so that would sort of give me a deeper background for the research that I was doing. The other thing that I would do is that, you know, like many things, um, writing a blog post will, at least for me, grow to fill whatever time you give it. And so I would deliberately set aside part of the morning close to my deadline for when I would really focus on it. Because if I started really early with respect to the deadline, I would just let it fill up time that really needed to be going to teaching or research or other kinds of responsibilities. So in some ways that was more stressful because I limited the amount of time I could spend on it, but it also meant that I was you know, making sure that I was also meeting my other commitments. Well, I was just going to ask that, you know, I'm sure we wonder like how many hours a week would you spend doing this? And it sounds like you blocked it off. So was there a certain number of hours you would just give it every week? And that's the kind of limit you would devote to it? You know, it, it varied from week to week. Um, I'm sure I'd be wildly inaccurate as research tells us I would be if I tried to just estimate it and I didn't do a good job of keeping track. I think there was a lot of variability because sometimes it was a fairly constrained topic where I knew I was going to write about a particular paper and it was a matter of reading that paper 
and writing about it. And what would happen to me fairly often is I'd read the paper and I'd discover that I wasn't so sure about the conclusions in experiment three. And did I really want to write about this paper? And then I'd have to go back and find another paper to write about. Or I'd discover something they cite in that paper that I wasn't familiar with that felt like was really important background for me to know. And so I'd go down uh, following that chain. Um, so as a result of that, there was really quite a broad range. I would probably say on the lower end, really lower end, maybe close to two hours, but then it could, it could definitely be quite a bit more than that if I started pursuing these additional avenues and started rewriting perhaps what I initially started writing. And I mean, related to that, do you feel like, you know, over the course of six years, which is an amazing amount of time to be doing weekly blog, it's, it's just so impressive that, did you feel like there was a kind of a learning curve with the writing that, you know, once you're into year two or three or four, it became quicker or a little bit easier to get into it and write it? Yes. I think one of the things that I became more comfortable with was getting to the point where something was good enough. And I think in part that comes from not being someone who in the rest of my life operates with uh, constant externally imposed deadlines of this type. You know, normally when I'm writing an academic paper, I might have a goal for when to submit it, but you, you can be close to a perfectionist, right? And, and for this, I realized that that was not going to work. I had to satisfy, so I just had to let go at some point and it was never going to be uh, as good as I would ideally like it to be. And most of the time that was okay. So I think I had repeated experience with satisfying and, and surviving the satisfying. Um, I think I did become more efficient with writing. And one of the things that I think is actually really nice about writing a blog post as opposed to other kinds of formats is that it's short enough that if I wrote something and in the course of writing it changed the way that I was thinking about it or, or came up with what would be a better way to introduce the topic, I could start from scratch. And that didn't feel... Um, uh, like an unrealistic proposition close to a deadline. Whereas, you know, for something like a book chapter or a book, you don't just have the luxury of casually deciding to, to start from scratch. And how long on average are, um, you know, the blog posts that you would submit? I that? think the typical range was about 500 words on the shorter side to about 1200 words on the longer side. And there were definitely exceptions, probably more exceptions on the longer side than the shorter side. Um, but we did, we did aim to be succinct. Yeah. And I imagine, you know, in thinking about, you know, some of the kind of frustrations and successes, I'd love to hear your thoughts on both. But I mean, you're speaking to a few things that make me think almost of like successes for other parts of your life as an academic in person, learning to let go, brevity in writing, which is a real challenge. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, are those the kind of key successes that stand out to you in, in this enterprise? I think in terms of the successes that translated to my other aspects of my job. One I think is I, I knew abstractly that it's very important to illustrate things with concrete examples and that you want your academic writing to be accessible. But I think having the experience of constantly trying to translate things for a general audience um, made me appreciate how important that is and then sometimes made me do that better in my academic writing. I mean, certainly I can think of more cases of frustrations, as you put it, than of successes. Um, I mean, I think one thing that was sometimes challenging was dealing with journalism norms that differ from academic norms. So in, in, in science, we're always very careful to attribute ideas to who came up with them and to have complete references and indicate where everything comes from. And I sort of felt like I had to sneak that in to this journalistic uh, Form, you know, you can't put in references the typical way, so it'd have to be in the form of hyperlinks, right? So, you'd, I, if there was an empirical claim, there'd be a link there that would link to the evidence supporting it, but you couldn't have, you know, parentheses and here's the five references that you should recognize for this. And I found that a little bit disorienting. Um, another thing I found disorienting was that typically the headlines are not something that's written by a blogger or by um, a, a writer if you're dealing with an edited publication. And so, most of the time, I, I didn't have any problem with the headlines that were chosen. And occasionally I felt like they pulled out the wrong message. They were may not have been strictly inaccurate, but were misleading. And, and a couple of times I did contest something about the headline and had them change it. So one that I remember like that was that I wrote something that involved primates in the title referring to humans. And that got changed into primates in quotes as if we're not really primates. And, and that, that I thought was problematic. And so I said, no, 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 we're, we're really primates. We have to take out the quotes. <laughs> Um, so there were a few places where there was some sort of back and forth. Um, but overall, I had actually really terrific editors at NPR and really enjoyed working with them. Would you ever suggest titles or did you usually just leave that blank and they come up with it on their own after reading what you had written? 
I did typically suggest something. I would say it was maybe used without modification, maybe 40% of the time. I think often there was something that was an element of what I suggested that then got adjusted. And sometimes it was something that was completely unrelated to what I had suggested. Yeah, I think that's something that many, I think people in our field aren't aware of, of like having uh, to let go of the power over your titles mm -hmm. since we give so much time and effort to it in our academic writing. That's right, and, and often associated text, right? So sometimes they'll pull out a couple of sentences to be below a headline or to be the teaser that leads to the article. And again, I would typically suggest something, but that wasn't always what ultimately ended up uh, being shared on the NPR website. So, I mean, looking back at, at your former self, I know you mentioned you had started a blog in psychology today and then through NPR. Um, is there anything that you wish your past self knew at that time when you first got started um, that you sort of learned through lived experience? I think one thing I would say to my past self and to people thinking about writing is not to wait for somebody to come to you. So this was, I was interested in writing for general audience and I did happen to have somebody come to me and, and offer this opportunity to blog. Um, but I think it makes sense to be sort of proactive rather than reactive about how one approaches this and to think about what kinds of venues one might want to write for and what kind of form and to go out and seek that out rather than expect it to come to you. I think I would also encourage my past self to maybe think about additional potential synergies between writing for general audience and other aspects of my job like teaching. So for example, um, I'm thinking right now about teaching Introduction to Cognitive Psychology this fall. And I might be able to pull a couple of my blog posts to accompany uh, chapters of the textbook and so on. But I think had I thought more carefully about the body of work that I was accumulating and the tens of thousands of words that I was writing, I might have been able to think about how to structure that in a way that might form a product at the end of the day that could also be used in other ways more successfully. So that's really interesting, like thinking about how to merge these identities of like your academic self and your kind of public outreach self. Uh, and this is just a question that I was thinking about as you were talking. I mean, to what extent do you feel like those identities are really different parts of, you know, how you've lived your professional life? And, you know, are there not as many opportunities to merge them as you hoped? Or do you feel like it's really something you're doing on the side? Like, how much does it integrate versus feel separate to you? I think it feels reasonably integrated for me. Um, my sense is that the norms in the discipline have changed, where there used to be a kind of distrust towards public outreach or a sense in which people would not consider that to be an academic contribution of the type that we typically recognize for things like promotion and tenure and so on. Um, and, and I think the field is changing. Um, certainly I would encourage it to change, to consider it one of many ways to be involved in teaching and service. I think it's a really important kind of teaching and service. So in that way, I think I regard it as part of my job and part of my professional identity. I think I've also found some unexpected places where it's turned out to be um, related to my professional life. So I've sometimes had graduate students find out about my work, prospective graduate students find out about my work initially through a blog post. And then that's what leads them to look at my website and find out about my research and then perhaps apply to, to work with me or just end up having a conversation with me at a conference. And maybe then I direct them to somebody else who's doing research that's more relevant to what they read about. Um, but I think just um, kind of being on the other end of the interaction that, that I was in when I first got into the field reading people and sort of now being in the position of being able to hopefully get some people enthusiastic about psychology and cognitive science is, is really satisfying. And I think it's the sort of thing that we try to do in successful courses and in successful outreach of other kinds too. So thinking about, you know, students and those who've approached you and I mean, really anyone in our field that's interested in doing more outreach and interested in learning about how to get there what advice would you have for, you know, aspiring students and other psychological scientists who want to get involved but really don't know where to begin? I think one thing I would say is to think about where there is the potential to make a unique contribution. So one thing that I would sometimes ask myself in deciding what topic to pursue for a blog post is, you know, is there a reason that I'm the person writing this? Because there are a lot, there are lots of excellent science journalists. There are many people doing a good job communicating different aspects of science. So what is it that I uniquely can bring to this? Is it that I have particular expertise in a topic? Is it that I can do a good job giving some insight into the process by which science works and that I can do that at the same time as 
saying something about these findings. So I think that's something people can ask themselves, right? So, so what is it that they can maybe uniquely contribute, I think is an important question. The other thing that I'd say is to maybe give some thought to what kinds of engagement you want to pursue. And in particular, what I have in mind is not just what kind of writing or in what venue, but what do you want your public profile to be? So I was told when I started blogging that I had to have a Twitter account. I didn't previously have one, so I started a Twitter account. Um, and as I'm sure is well known to everyone, there's all sorts of ways that you can choose to be or not to be involved in social media. And I think that's something that it's worth giving some thought to because you don't just wanna be reactive about it. You don't just wanna end up in the situation where, I mean, for example, what happened to me when I would write about climate change or perceptions of gun control laws or things like that, um, that I would get people going after me on Twitter. And um, I think it's worth thinking about how do you, do you want to spend an hour a day engaging with people on Twitter or other kinds of social media platforms? Or is that not a way that you want to spend your time? How will you deal with people going after you if you <laughs> happen to hit on a topic that, that uh, provokes that kind of response? Um, there's a kind of a different sort of thick skin that you need, I think, to be to have a, pro a public profile in certain ways than, than you do as an academic. I think a lot of us in going through graduate school and the publication process develop a thick skin where we, you know, we, can, we know what reviewer two might say and we become okay at dealing with those kinds of criticisms. And it's, it's just an entirely different kind of uh, set of criticisms that you might encounter if you're writing about the psychology of climate change denial um, uh, or engaging in other kinds of topics. So I think that's just something people should give some thought to and to think about what their policy is. I mean, for me, I've decided I don't wanna spend a huge amount of time engaging with people on Twitter. Um, I think some people do that really well and I admire them for it. I don't right now feel like that's how I wanna spend my time or that I would be um, doing it that effectively. And so I've just decided I'm not gonna, I'm gonna do a minimal level of that. But I, I think, you know, there's, there's just something for people to think about in advance because otherwise you can just get dragged into it. Right, as you're saying, you can become a kind of important other part of your, your life and time and interaction and to essentially choose wisely how you spend your time. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I think a point that's worth saying, if it's familiar and perhaps obvious one, is that there's, there's clearly an opportunity cost to spend your time doing this rather than something else, right? So I think another thing that I would encourage people to think about is not to ask yourself, should I engage in this form of public engagement or not as a yes or no question, but if I'm doing this, and dedicating time to doing this well, what is it I'm not doing, right? What am I willing to give up in terms of the way I'm investing my time in order to make room for this? And I'm really glad that many people do see value in writing for a general audience and public outreach. I think it's incredibly important, but I also think there are many ways to contribute and that's not the way that makes sense for everybody to contribute. Um, so there's lots of other things people could be doing as well. Great. Anything else you'd like to share about public outreach today? Um, thank you for engaging in this form of public outreach to the psychological community. Great. It's been thank fun talking to you, June. Yeah, thank you so much, Tanya, for speaking with us today. Really appreciate it.